Okay, welcome back. I hope you all were able to explore the platform, maybe check out the startup showcase or do some networking. Over the next few panels, we're gonna go deeper into the three key categories of fermentation that we discussed earlier. And now, GFI's new author moderated a discussion on the ways that traditional fermentation techniques with microbes and mycelium are being used to enhance plant-based foods. Welcome to Nate and our panelists. Thank you, Ale, Brian, BZ, Ina, for being here. And also thank you to our wonderfully engaged audience for joining us for this exciting panel on innovative applications for traditional fermentation in alt proteins. Uh, in case you're just joining or as a reminder, GFI defines traditional fermentation as the use of live microorganisms, basically to biologically process plant-derived ingredients as opposed to maybe chemical or mechanical means. So we have a great lineup here of panelists who are applying traditional fermentation in very different ways in different regions, in fact, across three continents right now. Um, so thank you for coming late at night, um, you know, and BZ. And uh, all are deploying very different business models. So we'll really get a great sampling of the, the potential of this technology. Uh, so I will introduce our panelists. We are honored to have Alay Manchuliansau, founder and CEO of Planetarians. Brian Clardy, head of R&D at Plantera Foods, a subsidiary of JBS. BZ Goldberg, CEO and director of R&D at the Mediterranean Food Lab. And Ina Viard, chief innovation officer at TFTAK, Center of Food and Fermentation Technologies. Over the next 35 to 40 minutes, we'll hit on implications for flavor, texture, nutrition, price, production methods with some predictions of the future. And then we'll reserve about five to 10 minutes at the end for audience Q&A. So please do, uh, audience, remember to put your questions in VBOX and upvote your favorite questions. And note that we're not focusing on the fermentation of traditional uh, fermented foods like tempeh, but rather innovation in the traditional fermentation technology category in terms of culinary applications or processing applications. So without further ado, we will dive into it and I will do kind of a round robin here and ask all the panelists to, in about two minutes, introduce yourself, your organization, and at a high level, the work that you're doing in fermentation. And uh, we can start with Alay. Oh, uh, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, I'm Alay Benchilanso, uh, the founder and CEO of Planetarians. And we at uh, Planetarians uh, try to make meats in a new way. What we use, uh, we use the solid state fermentation, where we convert uh, solid uh, uh, byproducts, technically, it's an animal feed. Uh, and into the high moisture meat envelope. This is the matrix that you normally use for making meats. Uh, this summer, we run uh, several successful trials where we demonstrated uh, feasibility of our technology on the major animal uh, meals like soybean meal, sunflower meal, uh, uh, corn DDGS, and even uh, uh, lower at, uh, for the uh, pea, we successfully made meats to demonstrate that the starchy, low protein uh, uh, byproduct streams can be effectively uh, used for making meats without animals. Thanks. So, How about Brian? Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah, thank you, Nate. Appreciate that. Um, so with Plantera Foods, we have launched our first retail brand of Ozo. We are a one-year young company based here in the Boulder, Colorado area. Um, so we have uh, six SKUs in the retail space and four into food service, expanding into uh, various channels with plant-based uh, meat equivalents. So um, burgers, grounds, sausages, nuggets, uh, really just developing great tasting, craveable plant-based items. Uh, and you And how we're engaging in the fermentation space is, is really through a various uh, variety of avenues. So I've worked with, uh, had the opportunity to work with Ale on a few of the th things that he's working on, as well as a few of the other panelists that you have, because really what we're trying to do is bring this technology to market and allow consumers to access great tasting, craveable, healthy, nutritionist, uh, cost-effective plant-based proteins and fermentation is no small part of that. And I know we'll go deep into uh, the different avenues and how we're uh, bringing that to market. Great. Uh, BZ. Unmute here. Um, 
Thank you, Nate, and um, thanks for the invitation to this uh, this panel. Um, the Mediterranean Food Lab is working with both science-driven and also um, kind of deep culinary knowledge in order to hack trimental fermentation, mostly kind of multi-phase solid state fermentation of plant protein. And we hack these processes in order to, to create richly flavored, meaty flavor bases, which can play the role that meat usually plays in making other foods, that is foods other than meat, more delicious um, uh, with extremely high health benefits and um, high sustainability. We're currently targeting the retail and food service spaces. We're um, in, in R&D right now with a, with a couple of, of uh, good working prototypes and, and POCs. Um, one of the things we've done in order to put together this uh, this startup company is we kind of turned the normal, usual food tech startup model on its head. Um, oftentimes, R&D questions are driven by food technologists and, um, and scientists, and then and, and R&D chefs are brought in to help them realize their uh, their visions or test particular um, products and make them kind of um, accessible to to uh, Consumers, we've done it the other way around. The people who are driving all of the R&D questions um, at this company are chefs and culinary experts who are kind of single-mindedly focused on deliciousness. That's the thing that interests us more than anything else. And we bring in uh, scientists and food technologists in order to help the chefs and, and culinary experts realize these um, uh, these visions. We're also, we're a little bit different. It's, it's, it's kind of, I always feel both tickled, intrigued, and, and maybe even a little bit shy um, having heard the previous panelists and sitting in panels on, on fermentation, working in traditional fermentation, because we find that we're so incre we're, we're, we're doing things that are very similar, but really, really different. Um, for example, we're working, working very much or trying to work very much with whole foods rather than isolates or concentrates. Um, and we are working very closely with farmers um, and, um, and with agriculture. I'm incredibly for biodiversity of approaches and innovation, but I still found myself moving kind of uncomfortably in the chair when I hear us talking about agriculture in terms of how we need to do away with these pesky inefficiencies um, in agriculture is still feeding most, uh, uh, most of the world and will for a long time. So we're working very, very closely with people who are, who are growing food and, and, um, and, and, and trying to create an ecosystem around, around these processes. Okay. Great, thank you. And last but not least, uh, least Ina, please. Well, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Anna Viard, and I work as the Chief Innovation Officer in uh, DEFTA, the Center of Food and Fermentation Technologies. So we are a, a privately owned contract research organization, and our main focus is to uh, develop innovative uh, solutions for the food and biotechnology industry. So we use a high throughput systems biology based approach to optimize cultivation technologies in order to either increase uh, biomass production or just the yield of target molecules when it comes to uh, precision fermentation. And we work both with uh, bacteria and fungi as well as uh, microbial consortia. So our main goal is to engineer the best uh, starter cultures uh, for plant-based uh, dairy products such as yogurt and cheese and also we try to use the same knowledge to uh, develop new kinds of uh, uh, meat alternatives uh, that resemble their animal-based originals not only in, in flavor and aroma but in nutritional value as well. But of course this means that we have to get uh, rid of all the anti-nutrients that are very common in, in plant proteins and plant materials in general and also pre-digest the proteins to make the products more nutritious and tastier. So how do we work? Uh, well our uh, clients come to us with either very specific problems that need solving or just with an idea for a new product. Then our experts provide solutions for those problems uh, or uh, help develop new recipes and technologies in our uh, pilot scale product development lab. Uh, what differs us from uh, many other service providers and academia is that we uh, use this agile product development approach which means that we work in very close collaboration with our customers and that means that we can obtain results uh, quite a lot faster. So once we're finished with the product at uh, lab scale, uh, we help our clients 
uh, actually implement uh, the technology uh, or the solution in, in real life situation and help uh, transfer the technology to production environment. So we support uh, the companies the whole way. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, so let's make this more tangible or, or concrete. Brian, could you please describe how you came about uh, uh, Ozo, the, particularly the use of Mycotechnologies Pure Taste protein in Ozo, and uh, what is uh, Pure Taste as well? <laughs> Certainly. Um, so as, as we kind of begin that discussion, it's interesting to note that uh, the world's largest protein company started Plantera Foods, and the reason why they they did that is um, recognizing that, uh, as BZ was talking about, with the traditional agricultural methods and the fact that they will be around in a, in a significant part of our uh, food chain and supply chain, but it's not necessarily the future of where food is going, um, recognizing that they wanted to uh, both maintain their current business model and expand into new ways to feed the world and specifically closing the gap as we look forward in the next 30 years uh the demand growth for protein um you know it's some people are estimating that it's going to the demand's going to grow by 70 percent which leaves a pretty significant gap in terms of what we're able to produce today with the current methodologies <clears throat> And so the plant-based um, food and protein specifically really has an opportunity, as, as do other technologies that we're also exploring, to help shore up that gap. And one of the core pillars and values within Plantera Food is around providing high-quality and nutritious food for all. And so that really brings me back to food equity and how we're, how we're creating this equity and the accessibility uh, for consumers to have access to great tasting protein around the world. And that's something that um, I think is, is very close to everyone's heart, both within this program as well as within our organization. And so as, as we think about the protein and what it brings, there's uh, the, the concept of complete protein and having all of the amino acids, the bioavailability to it uh, is something that we wanted to design into it as well as uh, breaking down the anti-nutritional factors that he uh, referenced, uh, specifically the phytate. So the pure taste product from Mycotechnology is something that we landed on as a core part of our formulation in providing that protein because of exactly that. The fermentation helps bring out the bioavailability, allowing us to have that complete protein, the balance between P, the rice and then the fermentation of the shiitake mycelia helps raise that bioavailability to over 100 from a dye, dye uh, analysis. So animal models have shown it to be a complete protein, which is important in terms of the quality as well as that bioavailability. And then when we think about the flavor, what we want to bring to the market, similar to what BZ was talking about, is great tasting food. We don't want there to be compromises when you select ozo. Uh, we want it to be craveable and great tasting. And what we found with the fermentation is a very significant decrease in the earthy, beany, nutty kinds of flavors while raising the mushroomy and some of the buttery flavors that come with it. So that umami potentiation as well really is, is valuable to us <clears throat> as we design meat-based analogs. Now, it's, it's not perfect. Anytime you ferment, there's obviously acids and other things that come with it. So there is a certain amount of formulation and balancing of flavors uh, that is required. But from a technology standpoint, we think that the, the good outweighs the bad there. And um, so that's, that's one of the areas that we're looking at. Great, thank you. And you know, we could uh, spend all day on a case study on that, but we've got uh, 45 <laughs> minutes sure. here. So I, I'll, I'll move on to maybe, uh, I, I think that maybe the idea of the traditional fermentation and the way that we're defining it can be, uh, you know, hard to maybe understand. So I think it's good to draw analogies to ways that it's used in other uh, applications. So Ina, during your PhD in chemical and materials technology, your thesis was, quote, diversity and stability of lactic acid bacteria during rye sourdough propagation. So it's, I think, safe to say you know a lot about 
rye sourdough propagation. So could you please, um, and, and now, you know, the, the meat application. So could you please describe how the process of you using microbes to make sourdough bread chewy and delicious is similar to the technology that we are now talking about to make plant-based meat or dairy uh, more delicious? Well, and not just more delicious, more nutritious too. Um, the microorganisms, the uh, lactic acid bacteria and yeast that are found in sourdough uh, and other similar continuously propagated foods, such as uh, kombucha that Liz already referred to, um, some fermented vegetables, uh, different kinds of, uh, kinds of traditional foods. Those organisms are very well adapted to their environment. So it means that they have evolved uh, during propagation to digest a, a wide variety of different carbohydrates and, and proteins found in either cereals or pulses or whatever is used as, as the uh, main ingredient. What they do is the, they break down the sugars and starches uh, in the sourdough in my case and uh, change the structure uh, of the proteins. I believe uh, Alec will uh, talk quite a bit about those proteins later on. Um, but by changing those, the structure of the proteins and partial, partially digesting them, um, that's the reason why many people who, for example, have trouble eating regular white bread can tolerate sourdough bread really well. Uh, the bacteria and the other microorganisms have already done the hard work for us. Um, so we know that um, it's a common perception that plant proteins are less valuable uh, in terms of nutrition compared to animal proteins. But if we use uh, fermentation, if we use these clever tricks, uh, we can actually significantly increase the uh, digestibility of plant proteins. And uh, of course, also the bioavailability of minerals and other functional compounds increases quite a lot because, uh, uh, like Brian al already mentioned, uh, there are phytates in uh, in many cereals and pulses. Also, vicin, uh, mm, convicin, when it comes to fava bean, so microbes can help us deal with all of those issues. And of course, it helps that fermentation takes care of quite a bit of those uh, uh, undesired off flavors and aromas as well. But the tricky thing is finding uh, the right organisms for the job. And that's exactly what we are trying to do here. So we look at uh, uh, organisms isolated from fermented foods uh, and, uh, and use um, uh, genome-based data uh, to actually select the most promising strains and uh, test them in, in various fermented foods. So then we can further uh, evolve those uh, into starter cultures, which can be used to improve both the sensory uh, properties and the nutritional value of fermented dairy and uh, meat alternatives. Awesome, thank you for those those wonderful insights. And yeah, I, I just think it's, um, you know, kind of obvious when you think about the fact that, you know, these, little mini nanoscale bioprocessors that have been, you know, selected for over millennia would be maybe more effective at, uh, you know, than the machines that we've developed in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and it's yeah, interesting to, you know, uh, hear more about how that works. So um, another transition here into flavor, uh, we've got to talk about flavor um, when we're talking about food. So BZ, could you talk about how your use of fermentation to create flavors uh, how that works and then how that maybe differs from the current way that we create flavors, particularly for plant-based meat, eggs, and dairy. Um, definitely. Maybe the, the best way for me to do this is I want to say a little bit about how we're, we're a little bit different than a lot of the other companies that are, that are here that are, that are playing and working in the, um, in the alternative protein or meat replacement space. And then I'll segue into, into specifically how, how we view flavor a little bit differently. Um, and, and so I'm going to try and go roundabout, but do it, do it quickly and start by looking at some macroeconomics that we looked at. Um, I don't have to, to mention in this forum that there's an explosion of activity in the meat replacement space for sure. But what we saw is interesting is that most of the companies and, and ventures and initiatives are emulating, um, if we talk about meat, are emulating a large piece of protein that sits in the middle of your plate. 
Um, and if you look at the meat world, at the meat market, if you take a look at a cow, only probably say about 20 or 25 percent of the cow are, is those kinds of cuts of meat. Whereas 30 percent, we think of the, of the cow, ends up in some way or another providing incredible flavor for other ingredients. Um, this happens via bones, meat. It's an incredibly stratified area. Uh, um, uh, field. It's, it's bones and meat and then things that are produced from bones and meat, like meat protein extract, or if you want, walked into the supermarket, you know, bullion and bullion cubes. And um, in other cultures, fish sauce, the entire, you know, Japanese cuisine is based on dashi, a broth made from fish. Um, Chinese cuisine is completely rooted in tang, um, broths made from, or stocks really made from mostly pork and, and poultry. Um, if you look at every su soup or sauce or casserole or stew, th this is a huge market that is kind of, um, we find a little bit of a, um, of a white space. And what we realized that if we solved the problem for steaks and burgers and nuggets, we still have to slaughter billions of animals every year to address the human appetite for flavor that's coming from um, animal protein. And we see this as a really big, um, as a big white space. Uh, and so we're trying to create uh, materials which can help you, um, you know, if, if in a real simplification, people have called us kind of the, um, the bullion, the, the, sorry, the, uh, the, the beyond meat of bullion cubes, um, which is very simplified because we're trying to do a little bit more than that. Um, and, um, and what that means is, so now in the meat, in, in, um, in the meat replacement space, most of what's happening is we're using very small quantities of flavoring agents that are used, you know, to someone who, who kind of knows from a home kitchen that are used sort of like the way vanilla essence is used. Usually less than 1% of, um, uh, of, of, of the product will be these flavoring agents. And they're usually added almost as an afterthought. Um, um, you know, you create the structure and then at the end you need to do something to make this whole thing taste good. Um, um, and I might be disparaging and I'm not, I'm not intending to at all. What we're trying to do or, or the model we're working with is something that's a little bit more like classical cooking. We're trying to create something that, that functions like a fond or like a bullion or like a demi-glass. And that's an inherent part of the, pro of the, of the product, in, you know, in percentage wise, somewhere between five and 15% of the product, depending on the, um, uh, of the product and and the way that fermentation is helping with this and specifically traditional fermentation not th this wouldn't work i think so much with precision fermentation but but traditional fermentation of plant protein the way that works is when meat you know is you know is actually quite bland when it's raw but when you heat meat you get hundreds of really interesting fascinating delicious compounds aroma and flavor compounds that are very complex and we and it's part of what makes meat so satisfying to eat now it's interesting when you work on, on fermentation on and specifically kind of on, on a more wild fermentation um, with many, many um, actors um, in the microbial world, you also get hundreds of compounds of flavor and aroma, many of which are very, very pleasing. Now they're not the same hundreds of compounds, um, and um, but some of them are similar. And I should say specifically our company, we're not actually working to try and get, you know, we, we fall not on the one-to-one -one flavor um, uh, side of the equation. We feel like that's best left to the big flavor houses, but we're trying to create the kind of satisfaction that people feel when they consume meat, not the exact one-to-one -one analog in terms of, um, um, uh, of flavor and, and doing that by creating these rich, you know, multi-compound, um, uh, um, ba really ba flavor bases that, like I said, can become an inherent part of a, of a, of a dish later on. Great. Yeah. Thank you for that, that wonderful explain around flavor. And, and meat is just so much more than the form, right? It's so much more than, you know, the pork chop uh, and, or the glass of milk, right? So I, yeah, I, I love the approach um, and could talk about flavor for a while, but we'll move on to uh, one thing that I think is just so exciting about fermentation is the aspects for texture um, as well. Um, so Brian, could you maybe talk a little bit about how microbes or mycelium or fermentation generally can take, you know, those globular plant proteins and make them behave more like muscles or otherwise, you know, just generally improve the, the texture of, of plant-based meats, which has, you know, been a challenge. 
Yeah, no, it's a it's a tremendous challenge, and um, you know, BZ was was doing an excellent job of discussing the the challenges of leveraging food chemistry, food science, biochemistry, and how we bring all of this together into a approachable, consumer friendly uh, experience. That is, like BZ was describing, maybe it's not exactly meat, but it's a craveable experience. And when we talk about this. Uh, the texture and the flavor and the aroma within the context of ozo, uh, we're not exactly trying to be meat, right? We, what we want is for consumers to be able to access, uh, you know, their their ground beef today and tomorrow they choose ozo. So we want to be craveable. We want to be familiar enough that it's a part of their life. And in order to do that and have that familiarity, to your point, it's a balance between the technology and the fermentation and how we're creating these structured proteins so that you have the fibers, the bite and the chew. But at the same time, the, what the trade off is there is you typically lose the water holding capacity and then you lose the juiciness, right? So we've got to balance the juiciness and the, the layering of the fat, how the flavors hit your palate, uh, the chew and the emulsification. All of those design features are very intentional in how you balance the process with the extrusion of the of the protein. So it's a multi-step process to arrive at our ingredients where you're you're both taking the, the flavor and fermenting it and then or the protein and fermenting it. And then beyond that, we have to add that texture for the bite and the chew. And so that textured protein in, in combination with uh, a globular protein allows us to have both the water holding capacity, the water binding gelation, all of the complex sensory analyses that come with meat uh, that you never really uh, think about or dimensionalize until you're trying to mimic it or, or come up with some sort of facsimile. And uh, so that, that fermentation plays a key role in being able to layer those flavors. And then the further processing of it is uh, really what even adds that something extra. So even a fermented base protein with pea and rice is not going to fully achieve that um, texture for you. Uh, there's a lot more involved. Yeah, that's wonderful. And excited for a deeper dive, I think, in texture in our next panel on, on biomass in particular. Um, so transitioning a little bit here into... Um, Protein content, LA, one of the, the really cool things um, that, that your process is able to do is uh, you know drastically increase the protein content of the, the feedstock. So could you just talk a little bit about how that works? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we use the three-step uh, approach. Uh, we use the dry fermentation, solid, uh, dry extrusion, solid-state fermentation, and uh, wet extrusion. And the role of the first step uh, 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 dry extrusion is to create the porous structure to increase the surface and allow the air flow during the next solid state fermentation step. And during the solid state fermentation, uh, we uh, use the uh, fungi to uh, digest sugars and starches uh, into uh, growing uh, themselves to produce extra protein, increasing the yield. And one of the surprising uh, results, we uh, increased the protein in the soybean meal up to 81%. Uh, so it's a whopping result, <laughs> almost isolated uh, with just solid fermentation. And uh, when fungi uh, produces uh, uh, the biomass, uh, the protein quality of the, this uh, biomass is higher. That allows us to increase the protein quality of the overall protein mix. And uh, to demonstrate here the upside, uh, we increase the uh, sum of essential amino acids uh, for corn, when we uh, fermented uh, corn DGS, up to 42%. So uh, think about the improved digestibility uh, during the next extrusion step. And you will have a good expectation of the increase in the PDCAS. And the third step, uh, wet extrusion. Uh, works as uh, the kill step with the high pressure and high uh, temperature uh, we sterilize it and uh, create the texture that we used to have uh, in, in the meats. And actually Brian uh, brilliantly described that that's uh, 
you may achieve a dry texture, hot texture like a chicken breast, or more succulent texture as you are uh, used to have from the brisket. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, achievable during the last step of the wet extrusion fermentation. And all these three steps, dry extrusion, solid state fermentation, wet extrusion, does not uh, uh, use any uh, uh, chemicals, so it's a clean process. It's also water efficient. So we use half a liter of water per one kg of biomass compared with uh, uh, submerged fermentation and isolation using the, on the uh, 20, 30 liters of water. Uh, and it's zero waste. Of all the ingredients we got uh, in the, uh, as the incoming step for the first extrusion uh, ends up uh, as they need. Uh, uh, so it's very efficient. So if anybody in this room uh, like the sustainability, so <laughs> we're happy to collaborate. Uh, that's in short uh, how our process works. Yeah. Yeah. So s sticking with you for a moment here, could you just elaborate on how that translates into maybe cheaper end prices or cheaper input prices in terms of what kind of feedstocks are able to use given your you know fermentation of the extra date uh, thank you for taking this because actually this is the the main probably differentiating point uh, for our approach so looking at the hockey sticks uh, of uh, the projected growth uh, of the alternative meats uh, every time I wonder where the meat alternative meat industry will get the proteins uh, because uh, technology is not the answer. Isolates, they need uh, crops to be grown, uh, fermentation, they need to get the sugar somewhere out. So, and the uh, cell based meats, it's a very complex uh, set of the nutrients that might be not readily available in the food system of the globe. So, and uh, but the whole idea of the alternative meats is to replace animal agriculture. That means uh, the uh, declining demand for the uh, animal feed uh, will make it uh, uh, a lot of types of animal feed available. So our technology uh, effectively processes uh, those uh, and focuses on those uh, uh, animal feeds. Uh, on our website, you may see the charts uh, comparing the prices. So, uh, animal feed is significantly cheaper uh, than any other uh, protein source, and this is uh, something combined with the zero waste, everything we got in and we uh, got out. This provides uh, the uh, cost savings. For instance, uh, after we completed our scale up trials, uh, our engineers uh, calculated and compared it uh, to soy, so the meats made from soy, the cheapest source of the protein on the market. And we got uh, the twice as lower costs, yeah? so imagine for the higher uh, 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 costing uh, ingredients like pea, yeah, at a pretty um, uh, small uh, capital needed to start manufacturing it. So let's say uh, typical uh, 10 million pound annual capacity black box. So it will cost you six million dollars. It's affordable for majority of the you know, co-manufacturers. It can be placed uh, on the uh, crushing facilities where the uh, sunflower or soil uh, you know, extracted uh, the oil. And what's more, actually, I like the uh, the most. It, that black box can be placed at animal uh, processing facilities, uh, allowing the smooth transition from uh, animal to alternative meat uh, uh, <laughs> uh, economy. So they can just balance the uh, demand according to their customers. Yeah, awesome, thank you. And we have about 10 minutes left, so uh, I will transition to some that are arising in the VVOX and also reserve kind of our last question of some predictions for the future for maybe like the last uh, two or three or four minutes as well. So, uh, Ina, there's a couple of questions here about, um, so I'll direct this to you one to start at least, about anti-nutritional factors. How, you know, what what is the process for using fermentation to remove those? Is there kind of a pre-fermentation step? And then, you know, after the fermentation, do you have to use some kind of processing step to remove those anti-nutritional factors after, or do they become, you know, metabolized fully? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the good questions. Um, 
what we do is we yes we actually use fermentation as a pre-treatment step prior to either mechanical or thermal processing so what we do is we use commonly uh, bacteria uh, to uh, degrade phytates and uh, and or um, lysine, conmycin, lectins uh, in the plant protein matrix. Uh, and then depending on the further application, we either uh, use it for uh, directly for extrusion or we have a uh, drying step uh, between those, those two. Uh, processes uh, and com and quite well usually you don't need to actually uh, extract any of the anti-nutrients you, you just use fermentation to break them down and that is that is basically it so so it's one of the most optimal ways of uh, improving the nutritional value uh, and um, the the protein digestibility and uh, uh, mineral absorption uh, increases quite significantly as a result. Yeah, I love it. You know, it's you're moving a lot of the downstream processing upstream and in mm -hmm. making it a lot simpler. Um, okay, so Brian, I'll point the next one to you. What do you think the role of fermentation in seafood is going to be? You're on mute, Brian. There we go. Not only was I on mute, I was on double mute. I had both my microphone and your system muted. But uh, yeah, seafood's an exciting category that we're really uh, interested in and in, in looking at. Um, there's, you know, the sustainability side to that uh, garners a lot of interest and in how fermentation can play into that is something where I think, you know, we were talking about pure taste where you're breaking down anti-nutritional factors and improving bioavailability. But I think as you look at solid state fermentation and the ability to actually create structures opens up new uh, capabilities, especially within the more delicate seafood textures. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity for somebody to design the right process to very closely mimic that that seafood flaky uh, texture within the fermentation space. Absolutely. Awesome. Do we have any uh gut microbiome pros on the panel <laughs> raise your hand yeah. there's a question about that yeah yeah i, I used to <laughs> I'll, 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 okay unless brian you can start and then pop over no no let's let's share it around what's what um what, what what's the question nate we could we can all try and, what, what, uh, what's the implication on the yeah, gut microbiome of these kinds of products you know do do some of the the fermentation, you know, microbes make it in, or you know, what's the overall impact on health? Maybe. Um, I think it really depends on the technology. Uh, in most of these, most of these technologies, I think that that most of I don't know, uh, you know, what what with the products you're working on, with many of these technologies. Um, the the micro the microbes themselves are not necessarily making in it. It also kind of depends on where the product is. If you think about a supermarket, which shelf it's on. If the product is refrigerated, then maybe there is a chance that some of the, the microorganisms make it through. If the product is um, is has to go through any kind of pasteurization, then you're not going to see any um, um, any um, any probiotics. Although um, if the product is designed well, you can see a lot of prebiotic function um, uh, with with fiber, uh, micro, you know, microbiome accessible fiber um, in there, but it really depends. It's a kind of case to case thing. I, I'm I'm curious, Ina, what about the, the the products that you're working on? Are they are the microbes coming along to the um, consumer? Uh, when, it, when it comes to the dairy alternatives, the, the plant-based dairy products, such as yogurts and cheeses, then uh, yes, we, we see quite a high number of uh, lactic acid bacteria. Uh, but uh, another thing that, uh, that we have maybe haven't considered before is that uh, instead of uh, these probiotics, uh, we will see the effect of postbiotics. The beneficial compounds that the bacteria produce uh, in the product during fermentation so even if they uh, 
get killed, for example, during extrusion or other types of thermal treatment processes, then uh, those active molecules are still in the product and might influence uh, our overall health. So that's, that's something. Yeah, thanks. And, and maybe just one more quick thing on the health aspects. There's some questions for clarification on uh, what it really means to have a complete protein or, you know, what is the quality of these proteins like? Maybe, Brian, you could go further into that. Yeah, absolutely. So the complete protein concept is is just acknowledging that you need 20 amino acids to make a full protein. So having all of those building blocks available and easy to digest um, allows you to more readily assimilate and build all of the proteins that your body needs in order to function. Um, so it's, it's just a uh, quality uh, as well as bioavailability concept. Great. And I want to transition into one more topic before the predictions. Um, and, and that's kind of the consumer facing aspects of how we, we, uh, you know, brand this whole thing. I think, you know, we talked about earlier biomass traditional precision isn't probably the consumer facing terms or even regulatory facing terms. Although, you know, traditional fermentation is probably the nicest for consumers. Um, in BZ, I've, I've seen, you know, there's been a lot of creativity in terms of how our companies are describing their use of fermentation, like, you know, microflora or BZ, I saw you used culinary microorganisms, which I thought was, was very clever. Um, just, I guess, BZ, starting with you, what are your thoughts on how we position fermentation? Do we just say plant-based? You know, do we appeal to beer brewery, traditional fermented foods? You know, how should we talk about this to consumers? Um I think that it's funny. We we never we actually weren't trying to be clever when we. Th that's just how we referred to them as they were. You know, because um, so many of, of our team come out of the kitchen, and actually we still insist that people who are working in the company um, uh, work at a restaurant or serve people food at least once a week. We want people to constantly be having um, uh, contact with them um, with people who are eating. Um, this is kind of pre-COVID times. Uh, it's a little shifty right now. Um, but um, I mean, when you look at it, and, and I'll go on a ledge here because there's so much incredible technology in this whole symposium and, and, and here as well. But, but I'll, 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 I'll go, it's like when it's, this technology and all the work that we're doing is very, very, very young. Um, so far, I don't, I don't think that food technology has not neared offering humanity what fermentation has offered humanity in terms of deliciousness. I mean, when you think about um, bread and beer and wine and cheese and coffee and chocolate and pickles, sauerkraut, kimchi, soy sauce, miso, it's like, um, and you compare those to, um, you know, to even, I, I apologize, extruded soy protein or, um, or um, you know, um, um, preservation by canning, or it's like, we're not there yet. And I think that people can very much relate to the deliciousness of all these products and that we don't have to, we've got to make sure not to run away from, the, um, you know, from this, but to, to state proudly, these are fermented products and, and help educate people and, and, and make them realize they're eating, they're eating yogurt, they're drinking vodka, they're drinking wine, they're eating, you know, it's, it, they're eating, and people who eat, who eat meat, um, there's this, you know, huge preference for dry aged meat. It's, it's all, you know, fermentation is huge and it's everywhere. Um, so my feeling is, you know, stand behind it proudly. Awesome. And uh, we've got about only about, you know, a minute or so left. So I'll have to cut it off there and we'll continue the conversation in, in, the, in the networking or something. Um, but everyone, if we could go around maybe in 15 seconds or so, one prediction for how you think traditional fermentation is going to evolve in something or something crazy it's going to allow us to do, you know, new processing methods, new feedstocks, new horse, host organisms, whatever it is. So, uh, Ina, I will start with you and then we'll go in that order we started with. 15 seconds. Thanks for that. Uh, so first thing, uh, uh, combining uh, fermentation as either pre or post treatment uh, step and combining it with mechanical and thermal processing. I think we will see a lot of uh, great things during the next couple of years using different organisms, different um, raw materials and, and so on. We will have a lot of different products. 
And the second thing, um, instead of using single uh, strains as starter cultures for fermentation, I think we will move on to using consortia, uh, combinations of bacteria and fungi uh, in which every organism has a distinct role, whether it's uh, breaking down anti-nutrients, uh, partially hydrolyzing proteins, and so on. Thanks. Awesome. Brian? Yes, very quickly, I, I agree. I think it's the combination between fermentation plus uh, technology process, whatever that may be, that continues to evolve this category closer to that whole muscle uh, experience that I know is sort of the holy grail. Yeah, very excited. Good transition to the next panel. Uh, Alay. Well, uh, when we discuss the fish, so I think that uh, fermentation uh, plus maybe uh, some extrusion allow plus uh, some flavor changes to umami allows to uh, offer the all three aspects: the texture, the flavor. So uh, just uh, uh, in one piece. So I think that uh, not only fish, but a lot of uh, new, how do you say that? Craveable experiences that uh, will be created, and uh, people unexpectedly for themselves find themselves. Yes, I want this. So I wish the fermentation yep. industry a lot of luck. Thank you, BZ. Send it off with some fireworks, please. So, so, um, so one thing for the immediate future is um, I happen to have the stage chat here, and it looks like postbiotics is um, is trending very, very strongly. Um, you've lit a fire in it. Uh, I agree with Ale. I'm I'm really curious and and um, expecting to see uh, fermentation of plant protein create things that are incredibly um, uh, uh, craveable. And I also am excited to see. It's like when you think about all the all the different kinds of microorganisms and substrates and processes and control points that can be exercised here. The amount of iterations are immense. And, and, and we've only just gotten started. There's an enormous amount of work and, and, um, and flavors and deliciousness and possibilities to discover here. Um, and I think that we will be discovering them. Wonderful, yeah, to deliciousness and beyond. Uh, tremendous amount of gratitude for our panelists and our audience. And uh, you're all free to leave uh, with the little red button or turn your, your video off and we'll hand it back to Caroline to introduce the next panel. Thanks everyone. Thank you to Nate and our panelists. It was another awesome discussion. Um, loved, loved the term culinary microbes. I think we might see more of that. Uh, and really interesting to hear how traditional fermentation is still evolving. Um, a couple other things I noted, you know, really great to hear the world's largest meat company or to quote, Ryan protein company um, is using mycelium for its newest plant-based product line um, and also the tremendous opportunities it sounds like they see an alternative seafood which came up again there at the end when we think about the future of the category um, as Brian had said with you know a projected 70 percent um, growth and demand for protein I think we can see how fermentation is going to be really key in helping us meet that and also, as Alla said, the hockey stick growth projections for alternative protein. I thought it was also really interesting um, how, you know, traditional fermentation can be used not just to improve the flavor and texture, but also to increase protein content. So loved learning about um, that process. And then as Ina said, you know, it makes them uh, not just more nutritious, but more delicious. Um, and finally, really noted how um, the process can allow for increased digestibility and a bioavailability of plant proteins. So I hope you enjoyed that as well. And now we're going to actually move right into our next panel. David Welch, GFI's Director of Science and Technology, will be facilitating a discussion on that second type of fermentation, biomass fermentation. And you'll learn why this type of fermentation presents the food industry with a fast, inexpensive and sustainable production process for creating both high protein ingredients and standalone products. So thanks for your patience as we momentarily stop broadcasting and get this next group ready for the stage. <laughs>